All right. Uh, in the last uh, lecture, we uh, stopped here when we talked about the Hertzberg Russell uh, diagram, and we called this HR diagram. And in the y axis, we have the luminosity. On the x axis, we have the temperature. And I told you if you go this way, the temperature increases. And if you go that way, the luminosity uh, increases. And for the luminosity, it will be L divided by L. And when I told you, whenever you see subscript like this, it means it's the sun. If it's M, that means the mass of the sun. If it's R, that means the radius of the sun. So when we look at the, uh, the HR diagram, you see that in the y-axis, the luminosity is measured relative to the luminosity of the sun. So the sun here has one because you're dividing the luminosity of the sun by itself and you get one. And then you have stars that have more luminosity than the sun and of course those that have lower. So if you look at the x-axis here, we go from lower temperature M stars all the way to the O stars. Notes the colors. We go from red and red has a longer wavelength than to the yellow, than to the blue. And now look here at the sun. It's basically in this region here where you can see it's color yellow. The, the color of the sun, by the way, is white, but it's due to the atmosphere of the sun that we see this. And that's, of course, due to when we look at the spectrum. So that's basically the HR diagram. When the stars are in equilibrium, that means uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium and they're fusing hydrogen uh, to produce uh, energy, they will be here. Then after that, they may depart above the main sequence. And when they die, some of them, they may actually be white dwarfs and they come below the main sequence. But now, when we say an MS star, that means the star is on the main uh, sequence and it is uh, performing nuclear fusion. Now, you look at the line that it's drawn here. And when you look at this line here, you see that whatever is in this line has the same uh, uh, luminosity, but they come from different temperatures. And there is an impression that if the star is very hot, that means it's going to be more luminous. So why we have M stars that are cool, yet they have very high uh, luminosity. Okay. So uh, what is basically causing this, it's also we have to include the luminosity here is a proportional to two things. It's a proportional to the uh, radius of the star, how big it is, and the temperature. So you may have a star with a cooler temperature, but it's a bigger size and it will give you the same luminosity. So that should not be a contradiction here. When you see a cooler star, but it produces the same luminosity as a bright star, we have to take in consideration as well, how big is this star? So here we say uh, you, this is the open star cluster M39. And you can see blue. And as I told you in the colors, red means cooler, yellow, and then blue. That's how the, uh, we see an increase in the temperature. So we say here, bright stars are either blue, usually hot, or red, usually cold. Is this a contradiction? I already, in the slide before that, I told you when the star has a bigger surface area, it's going to produce also brightness there. So that should be an issue here. So now, when we look at the HR diagram, and when we look at the HR diagram, 
and I told you we have here the main sequence. Then we can see stars that are basically below and stars above. Something emerges out of this HR diagram as well. That means if you go diagonally this way, the size will increase. So as you can see here, when we look at the sun and you look at the dash line that goes through the sun here, we say it's equal to one R and there is a subscript of the circle with a dot at the center and that means it is what it is the, uh, uh, it is for the radius of the sun. Now below this, they are smaller than the radius of the sun Above this, they are more than the radius of the sun. So this one here is 100 times the radius of the sun. Anything here, it's basically uh, about uh, 1,000 the radius of the sun. So Betelgeuse, which is one star in the constellation of Orion, and I gave you that as a bonus to look at in the night sky. Okay. So it is very huge. It's about... Uh, a thousand times in radius as the sun and it's uh, it looks brighter in the constellation but in here we see the sun is brighter because it's here but i told you there are techniques where we can basically infer the brightness of these stars so this star is bright and there are now some talk about this star it is basically um, going through an instability, it might be about to uh, explode. And we'll talk about nova and supernova uh, later on in, in the lecture. So if you go uh, this way, the temperature increases. If you go this way, the luminosity increases. But if you go diagonally this way, that's when the size is going to increase. And that's where we see that here we have the uh, giants and the super giants. So here is as large as the sun, a hundred times as the radius of the sun, uh, 10,000 times the radius of the sun. Regal is one of the stars that is also in the constellation of Orion. And I told you to look at that. Battle juice. Okay. That's where the sun is. Polaris, remember the north star that we look for so now in the hr diagram we have stars that we call giants or super giants and these are just some of the stars here uh, that we uh, consider them as giant or super giants and these are the relative sizes remember about vega that i told you in the constellation of lara and that in 12,000 years will be the star to look for if we want to look for the north celestial pole now of course here we have things that we call white dwarfs and we'll talk about white dwarf uh, later in, in this lecture so this is how the h diagram looks like and you for every star uh, that the surface temperature is known the Luminosity is known, you actually put them here. So in the x-axis here, you have the temperature in Kelvin. And I told you, if you go this way, the temperature increases. If you go this way, the luminosity increases. And if you go this way, diagonally, the size will increase. Now, this is what we call the main sequence. And you can see most of the stars are populated in the lower part of the main sequence. Now, stars that we have here, they either be giants or super giants. Things that we have here, they're small stars that we call them white dwarfs. And of course, white dwarfs will lose energy and they may actually become black as well. So that's the HR diagram. And I told you, we do these diagrams for many things just to I told you that for uh, kids or for uh, adults, we can look at underweight over. We do these type of things. So that's done here with the stars. So when you look at an HR diagram, that's how you should read it. 
And when you hear the word, you may actually uh, uh, watch a documentary or something like this, and you may hear an MS star. Well, an MS star, that means the star is on the main sequence. That means it's an hydrostatic equilibrium, and it's functioning like a normal star, fusing uh, elements like hydrogen, which is uh, with light and nuclei, to form ones that are heavier. Is this clear? Any question on this HR diagram? So that's the HR diagram. Now, how stars basically produce energy? So in this section, we talk about the source of stellar energy. And you already know. We already talked about, in chapter number eight, we talked about the sun. And that's basically how stars work. So stars produce energy in their course by nuclear fusion. So that's basically how stars produce uh, the energy. And it is also possible to calculate the approximate star lifetime if we know its mass. So T here, which is the lifetime of star, is 1 divided by m, where m is raised to the power 2.5. So we have here an examples, okay? If we look at an O star, which is a very hot star, it has a lifetime of about million years. A G star like the sun has a lifetime of about 10 billion years. Uh, years and we already talked in chapter number six how old is our solar system is about five billion years so the sun still have still has five billion years to go so if you have any plans don't worry about them you still can continue uh, to achieve your dreams if you can live that long and m star has a lifetime of about five uh, thousand billion years so we can also look at the age of these stars if we know their masses now when it comes to stars and we already talked about the sun so the first stage is basically fusing hydrogen to make helium and remember I told you we need a temperature more than 10 million degrees to overcome this coulomb, coulomb barrier. Now, this stage is about 90% of the life uh, span of the star. Star will be there for about 90% of its 90% uh, of its lifetime. And then, in that, the second stage now. It starts fusing helium to make carbon. Now, the nucleus of helium now has two protons inside, unlike the hydrogen, which has one proton inside. So the, the helium nucleus now it's bigger. And the repulsion will be bigger. So we will expect that the star may basically start increasing in size. So we say here for a star like uh, ours, the sun, uh, it starts after this stage. So when it starts basically getting to the stage where it's going to uh, fuse helium to carbon, that's probably where uh, we get carbon in the core of the star. And the star will become a uh, giant or red giant, and then basically it will end its life. Now, for massive stars, stars that are more than eight solar masses, they can go on producing heavier elements. Uh, they can, especially the heavy ones, they can go all the way to iron. And I told you. The a nucleus of iron is tightly bound. So it's very hard to fuse 
uh, more. And that's why I told you in terms of energy, and instead of going with a fusion, we go with fission. So in a nutshell, stars start with a light element in their core, like hydrogen, and they end up with a heavy element core. Uh, so usually when, you when we look at stars, we can put them in two general categories. Stars that are less than eight solar masses and stars that are bigger than eight solar masses. And these are the big stars. So when you look at a star, that's what's going to happen. It's going to fuse elements hydrogen to helium to carbon now you know that the heavier elements will become more dense so what will happen is uh, they will sink and the lighter one will become on top and you have something like this where you can basically and the core here that's for the heavy stars the very heavy stars you have basically iron in the core and then you have uh, these uh, elements on top. So that's when we look at a red super giant and we look at the core here, that's what you see inside. Of course, it will have a shell of uh, helium and uh, hydrogen. Now, this is just to uh, something that way. If you, if you take an onion and you cut that, basically you will get rings like that so that resembles what you can go from the center up you basically going to see the heavy elements in the core and then above them will be the lighter elements so how stars basically come into existence and then they depart stars are born inside the huge interstellar clouds in general in three steps the giant molecular cloud now if this giant molecular cloud encounters shock waves a gravity now because they uh, the uh, atoms can move the gravity will take over and start condensing things and this is when you get dense cores. And after the dense core, you get something that we call proto-star. And a proto-star is coming from prototype. That means whenever you want to do something, you'll do prototype first to test it. And this is what we call a T tori star. So that's one stage before coming into a full star. And remember in chapter number six when we talked about uh, the solar nebula theory and we said the evidence that support that you can basically look for young stars with a thin disk around them and we basically said t tori so you're looking at the protostar there it's done and then when the uh, star start functioning it pushes the material away and it falls rings and then basically how this is how you get the planets so the stars are classified into two main groups less than eight solar masses and greater than eight solar masses so the one that are less than eight solar masses they as i told you the general they start with giant molecular cloud sharp wave gravity uh, takes over you get condensed cores you get a t tori then you get to a uh, a stable star hydrostatically stable star and that's where the star is going to be on the main sequence fusing hydrogen to make helium and it spends about 90 percent of its lifespan on the main sequence or as an ms star then the star basically will start going toward heavier elements from hydrogen to helium and so on and that's when the star basically going to become a giant star. It's going to 
become a little bit bigger now. More pressure outside. The gravity is pulling in, but now more pressure outside because you need, uh, uh, you're producing more energy now with this. Then it will explode and it gives something that we call planetary nebula. The planetary here, I think it's a wrong name, okay? Uh, it's not a planet that has exploded, but that's, you know, sometimes we have to stick with the names that uh, things are given to when uh, it was classified or things like that. So that's, it is a nebula, okay? But it's not really planetary nebula. We don't even know if this will be a place where uh, planetary system will be uh, born. And what's left of the star? It will be a uh, white uh, dwarf. So I just probably take you ahead and then probably we come later to this. Remember when we talked about hydrostatic equilibrium and we said the hydrostatic equilibrium comes because a gravity is trying to push in and the you producing heat and that basically is going to create a pressure outside when these two are in equilibrium we say that the star is in hydrostatic equilibrium and it's uh, uh now it's fusing uh, uh fuel to make uh, with with the nuclear fusion what happens when the star now is going to get bigger because of i told you that it's going to become bigger in size it's going to heavier and heavier elements now when it does that the star is going to become big either we call it giant or super giant okay now at some stage the star will be unstable that means the gravity that is trying to pull the material in, it will be greater than the outward pressure. And then that's when the star is going to collapse. So the material will go toward the center very fast. It condenses to a small point. And of course, the outer shell will explode. This is actually where the star, uh, in, in some cases, going to give you this white dwarf. So the white dwarf is basically the material when the star basically wants to explode that in, it, it collapses and it comes to the center and it forms something that we call a white dwarf. A white dwarf usually has the size like a planet, but it has a mass like the mass of the sun. So imagine, uh, I told you, I think in previous lectures, uh, we said that the radius or the diameter of the earth is 12,756 kilometers. And we said the diameter of the sun is 109 times the diameter of the earth. Now imagine if you collapse the mass of the sun into uh, the size of the planet like the earth, it would become very dense. So that's what a white dwarf is. But there is a limit on that. White dwarfs cannot exceed uh, more than 1.4 solar masses. So that's when we look at stars that are basically more than eight uh, solar masses, they will be basically uh, exploding. And then when they explode, they will basically uh, make a uh, uh, a white dwarf, now this is basically a stage where you can basically look at thin disks around young stars and so on, where it is a stage in the 
formation or how stars are born. So you start from giant molecular cloud, then basically you're going to get to condense uh, dense cores, then you get to a T tori with rings around it, and then finally you have what you have, the star. And that's the stage where we say it is a T tori star. It's not really not condense enough to become a normal star. And it's one stage before coming into a star. That's what we call prototype star. When it basically comes to hydrostatic equilibrium, that means the gravity that it's trying to bring in is balanced by the pressure that comes from the heat that the uh, fusion is producing, then now it's a normal star and it will be basically a, a main sequence star. And of course, it will start fusing uh, hydrogen to make helium, and then from helium goes to carbon and so on, and you will end up with uh, something in the core, the heavier will be below, then the lighter, then the lighter, and so on, the star will become bigger. So the star will start from an MS star, once basically it become a, uh, a stable star, let's take the case here of the uh, sun, and then basically it will go through these stages where it's going to become a uh, red giant or red super giant and so on. And then after that, it will uh, explode, gravity will win, the star will collapse, and the material will come into the core, and then the outer shell will be basically causing something like this, which you call a napula. And what's left is what we call a white dwarf. So usually stars that are less than eight solar masses, they may end up at the end as a white dwarf. A white dwarf is something that has the size like planet Earth, has a mass comparable to the mass of the sun, but it no longer can produce energy. It just basically losing, continuously losing energy doesn't have the mechanism for uh, nuclear fusion anymore and since it does that eventually it's going to start lose this energy and will may become at some point where we call a black dwarf or something like this so a star like this it may we did not talk about the stages where it's come into existence but we take it from where it become a uh, main sequence star and it will become giant and then finally it will explode and it dies and it gives us a white dwarf. This is where I told you when gravity wins, the star okay, will collapse. Yeah, that means it will collapse in itself. And this is what you end up getting at the center. So usually we try to look for white dwarfs. And the outer shell of this, it will explode and it gives you something which is uh, what we call a napula. Now, I told you again, when you look at these colors, uh, the techniques that we use, we, use, we measure the energy uh, of the electromagnetic waves. And then we add in colors but it is not just uh, uh, adding them in a way randomly, no. Uh, it is how astronomers think that that's how it should look like. So artists come in and they actually uh, add these colors to come up with this final uh, image that you see. So I always I tell you that you have to be careful. Uh, these images sometimes are not dark images, uh, uh, direct images. So there is some artistic rendition they are added just to show you the overall effect. Now just to give you an idea, uh, that's our sun uh, today and that's when the sun is going to become 
uh, giant, red giant. And this is, of course, when it becomes unstable and uh, gravity will take over and the star will collapse and you get a white dwarf and then you get an apple around it. So that's big, the basic idea of how star comes in uh, and it departs. And I told you in, our, in the case of our sun, we expect it to live for about 10 billion years. Five is gone. We have another five to go. So if you look at the cycle, giant molecular clouds, shock waves, uh, gravity will start basically forming dense cores. Then you get the protostar, a T-Tori, and it will become a main sequence star. So well, basically, it's a competition between uh, the gravity and the outward pressure. Finally, it becomes a main sequence star and stays for a long time on the main sequence. And then it starts basically when it consumes most of its hydrogen and it starts going for heavier elements. Then the star is going to become bigger and bigger and eventually it will become a red giant and it will collapse on itself. All the material will go toward the center and what emerges from there is a white dwarf and you can see the color of the white dwarf here it's being less and less okay meaning that uh, over time it will continuously losing its energy and that's where we say a g-type star and you know what the g is now it's based on the surface temperature of the star and we say that the sun is a g2 uh, star i told you we're only concentrate on the letter g the numbers that you see after that, it has to do with the type of lines that you see in the spectrum and so on. It's not really uh, that important for us. So these are nice uh, napular here and you try and to locate uh, white dwarfs. Is it easy to see these white dwarfs? Well, if they are like the size of a planet, and the stars are far away from here. Uh, their surface area is very small. So direct uh, uh, visualization of this is not something easy. So you may actually see them as when they become part of a binary system like series A and B, where this is actually a white a dwarf now. And that became a companion to another star. And I told you, this it plays a role when the bigger star wants to end its life. So there is a uh, center of gravity here that the white dwarf will provide. And when the star becomes huge, and it's going to go through that collapse, it will burst. And what will happen, the material will be accreted on the uh, white dwarfs. But white dwarfs cannot exceed 1.4 uh, solar masses. And that's when you see an explosion, which you call nova. Or it's also given a name as supernova type 1A. So... This is something when you look at stars, you try to look at the light that comes from them, you look at their brightness, you look at the spectrum. That's the Nova Hercules and that happened. That's in March of 1955. That's in May of 1935. You see a big bright uh, uh, glow in the sky. That's basically because the star now has gone through a nova. Now remember, when you look at things, you don't see them now, you see them in the past. That does mean that the star uh, just went into a nova at that time. So maybe there is a star now that's going through a nova, maybe down the line, uh, humans will watch that in the night sky because life will take some time 
to reach them. That's when you look at the luminosity of star and then all of a sudden you see uh, a brightness in it. And it has been seen through history that some basically have seen it glow in the night sky and that's basically due to uh, a nova or supernova. Now for stars that are more than eight solar masses, it's the same thing. They start from a giant molecular cloud, sharp waves, gravity takes in, you get the dense cores, the t tori star, and then the star becomes main sequence star, an MS star, and start basically fusing hydrogen to make helium. Then it will continue to heavier elements. Now, in some of the big stars, they can go all the way to iron. Now, they will become super giants. And they will give you something that it is super nova. A violent process. And I told you, the star will become big. And it will collapse. So the material will come very fast toward the center. So it will be more dense. So the likely process that you're going to get with this is either you're going to get what we call a neutron star or we get a black hole because it would become a neutron star you know what when we talked about atoms and we said that inside the atom you have a nucleus and inside the nucleus you have protons plus neutrons and the diameter here is approximately about 10 raised to the power minus 15 meters. Now around them you have a cloud of electron. The cloud of electron is around 10 raised to the power minus 10 meters. If you look at the ratio, it's about 100,000 times more. And these are electrons. So imagine if these electrons are combined with the protons and they give you neutrons. So you're basically condensing everything or you're condensing these atoms to the size of the neutrons. And that's why they call it to the size of the nucleus of the atom. And that's why we call it a neutron star. And of course, it's going to become or it's going to spin very fast. Now, it, uh, if you remember in the first uh, lecture that uh, in the course I told you that uh, protons if they smash together they will be actually give you quarks and if you smash quarks you will get even smaller elementary particles and that's in the case of a black hole that means you're getting things that are smaller than uh, a neutron and there are sometimes people are thinking about, well, maybe we have a quark star. And you go to uh, black holes. So this is basically happens for the ones that are more than eight solar masses. So when you have a big star, now you have more elements in it. If you go from the core all the way up, you have more elements into this. So you can basically start from uh, a main sequence star and you start basically making other things in the way and forming uh, heavier and heavier elements. And then eventually the gravity will win and the star will collapse and you may end up getting with one of these events, either a neutron star or a black hole. Now, in uh, the constellation of Orion, uh, Betelgeuse is a famous star. And now there is a thought if it's a stable or if it's going through that. Now, what we see there, some people are seeing some variation in the intensity and maybe the star is going through something. But we received this, uh, we have to wait for the light. Maybe it's already it's gone through some process. So once it collapses around itself, 
the outer shell will give you this nice napula and what falls toward the center basically you will get a dense material and that dense material it could be either a neutron star that means it will be condensing to the size i mean the uh, whole uh, atoms they will be condensing to the size of the nucleus or you get basically a black hole that's what you see here a loss from a super giant star and you start basically this is known as the supernova sn uh, 1987a so that was something that happened in 1978 that's supernova i think some people claim that they have seen something like this now how do we basically look at black holes or neutron stars how can we see them they a neutron star has a small surface area and it's very far, far away from here. So how can we confirm their existence? Black holes, how can we confirm their existence? So when it comes to a neutron star, a neutron star now has the size like the size of a city, but it has a mass somewhere between 1.4 to 3 solar masses so imagine the mass of the sun is condensing the size of the city that you're living in and it becomes very dense now when it becomes very dense it's going to spin very fast we have a concept in physics that we say conservation of angular momentum when you look at ice skaters and when they spread their arms out they slow down and when they bring their arms in they start spinning very fast that means they are basically reducing something that we call the moment energy now this will happen if you have something which is very huge and then it condenses into something very small because I told you things are rotating and moving okay, there nothing stationary so they will be spinning very fast when they will be spinning they will have an axis around which they are basically rotating but they also have a uh, electromagnetic radiations and magnetic fields and so on so they are going to beam this radiation out and this it comes to us like pulses and that's why we say it is a pulsar so sometimes a neutron star is regarded as a pulsar and we look at these pulses and from this it has been decided that yes, okay, the magnetic field is not really on the same axis of the rotation and the neutron star will be spinning very fast. It's sometimes that referred to as the light house model. You know, when you have a lighthouse to guide the ships to go in and these basically would be going around sending in this light in the same way. Astronomers look at that. And that's how they can basically decide on neutron stars. There are many situations where this is the crab pulsar where you basically can look uh, at the pulses that we receive and we can decide on the sites and so on. Now black hole, can we see a black hole? I think in the, uh, when we discussed uh, chapter uh, number uh, six and I told you about interferometry, and I told you that there are big projects that they combine telescopes together. They look at the black hole in the center of the M87 galaxy. And they get an image of that. That be regarded as what we can say as a dark image. Well, a black hole is something that's very dense. Uh, even light cannot escape from a black hole and that's why we call it a black
لا hole. And the only way that you can know of a black hole, if a star close to it, and that star being shredded away by the black hole. So you really have to see some material around it to see the black hole. Remember the case of the uh, white dwarf when it accretes material? That's when the star is piercing out. But in this case, no. The black hole is basically shredding that star. And it's taken all the material and it's getting a, an accretion disk around it. And that's basically mass uh, flow transfer air. The, and then it's very fast and it will emit radiation in the X-ray. So when we see an accretion disk moving fast, and we see x-rays and so on, then we know that there is a black hole. But if it's by itself, it's not that easy to uh, observe. Now, we're not talking about black holes here, but we're talking about how it can, a star can produce a black hole. So in general, stars will start from the main sequence, and they will go through different stages. They may end up being as a white dwarf, or they may end up being as a neutron star, or they may end up as a black hole. That depends on the size of the star and the collapsing material that will condense in the center and, of course, the, ex the expelled outer envelope of the star that will basically give you that uh, envelope, okay, which is an apira. So the three likely scenarios when a star departs, it's either white dwarfs, but something that we call the Chandra Sikar limit is an Indian scientist who basically uh, did this, and he said, well, white dwarfs cannot exceed 1.4 solar masses, and then you have uh, neutron stars, the maximum could be about three solar masses. And then you have black holes that result from stars, and they should be about three uh, 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 to uh, more uh, in terms of size, and that's what we call uh, the Swatchild radius probably in the next lecture I'll try to talk about it a little bit. So these are the likely scenarios when a star or in the death of star. So like everything in life, things we get born and then they die and things like continue. So this is basically the three scenarios here. But uh, we're not talking about black, about black holes here. And there are uh, huge, what we call supermassive black holes that exist in the center of galaxies and so on, and that maybe becomes at the result of uh, merger of a black holes and so on. But here we're just talking about what happens when a star dies. Uh, any questions on this? Is this clear? Any questions? In the next lecture, we'll try to do the review questions and probably uh, shed some light on the things that we did here.